A. So we've heard the word uh, globalization bandied about without actually realizing what it means for us in the physical sense. And the reason for that is because globalization is typically something that is discussed by economists and academics. And the structure we have in the West is that you don't really get to a point in time where you get to travel uh, as much as you otherwise could, because once you achieve tenure, you're working on research, but in many cases, your research is, is quite specific. And before you achieve tenure, you're of course, locked down into writing a dissertation. So all of this makes it very hard to have discussions about very important topics like racism, like globalization, like technology, because so much of the public space that we see dedicated to these issues, these sort of quasi-philosophical issues, is in fact dominant, dominated by, or I would also say controlled by, uh, experts and academics. And that is not necessarily a bad thing, because so much of understanding something like globalization requires at least some minimal understanding of history. And that, of course, requires, you know, <laughs> some sort of specialization and a decent education. What globalization really means is if I'm a country like the United States and I don't have access to good coffee other than Hawaii, where it's where labor is quite expensive, I'm able to ship that from another country, whether it's Africa or whether it's in Indonesia. I'm able to leverage my banking system and my strengths in order to negotiate a trade deal, a multi-year trade deal that gives me something that I wouldn't otherwise have access to as a physical good. If I'm Singapore and I have an agreement with water for water from Malaysia and something goes wrong, then at the same time, I'm able to diversify my access to resources and go to Australia and make a deal with Australia, getting access to water, or I can go to Japan, get access to technology that allows me to recycle water so I'm not dependent on any particular single source. Those are, in a nutshell, those are probably the two top things that people should think about when they think about globalization. Now, it gets confusing because you know, you, you, what you notice, especially after the Vietnam War, after 1955, is that some countries have better access to more resources, especially oil and gas. And so if you're going to send a ship from the port of Los Angeles to Singapore, South Africa, Australia, you know, maybe, you know, and so on, you essentially are in a position where you have to have a lot more to trade than just coffee and water. So you build these economies all over the world that as of today, especially given its importance in World War II, is really based on a system revolving around oil and gas. And that explains so much of the recent history, whether it's the break off of Kuwait, whether it's the multiple wars in Iraq, which has oil, but also tremendous natural gas. It explains why Qatar is so often sort of bounced around between the Arab League and so, and so many other competing interests. Because the fact of the matter is that the oil and gas is something that people need, but it, it wasn't always the case we can easily imagine a society that runs on something other than oil and gas. It's not gonna look like this. Like if you just look around you, put a car behind me, that is an oil-based car. I'm, I'm walking on asphalt on a street that is made with an oil byproduct. I'm holding something in my hands, a weight that's covered in a form of plastic, which is again, an oil byproduct. Now, we mentioned South Africa. 
It also turns out that resources include things that are malleable with high utility, as well as being sturdy. And what that really means is when we're making things, we can't make everything with steel. We have to make it so that it lasts and also so that it's not, it's, it, it, it comes from hopefully a nearly inexhaustible supply. So that obviously includes things like gold, silver, platinum. We tend to think of these things, of these metals as jewelry, as some sort of fanciful vanity plates. But in reality, it's almost every medical device, every cell phone has had a tiny portion of these metals. Uh, these also include things like rare earth minerals and so on. So one of the biggest problems in society, society today is that when we tend to think of things like gold, which is finite, we don't actually think of them in the capacity that truly makes them important. We tend to think of them in very superficial ways. There's a reason for that, primarily. Oh, there's one I look at. Hi. I don't know if you can see it. Somewhere there. Nope. Hi. Uh oh, oh. <laughs> so, what ends up happening is that in order to make the explication and exploration of these things acceptable to society because they do involve tremendous environmental costs, there's a, we tend to think of them in very either superficial or beneficial ways. In other words, in ways that don't truly consider the costs of a society where we're walking on an oil byproduct in a car that's run by gas or oil. And ultimately, the idea behind this kind of an economy made a lot of sense in World War II. It created a situation where you could trade with anybody all over the world because you had this access to something that people wanted. It was difficult to extract. You needed technology. It created a lot of jobs. It also maintained the viability of the Navy. It increased shipping, which continued to maintain the importance of ports. And all the, all the places that you think about, by the way, that tend to have a high presence in marketing and fashion and so on, the things that we see on television, on social media, if you think about it, whether it's New York, Los Angeles, um, just think of any major city, Tokyo, although maybe Kobe would be a better example. Um, all of them are ports. Singapore, South Africa. The reason that this is the case is again, because the world economy is not really based on coffee. It's based on these minerals and metals and oil and gas. Essentially, it's based on resources. But the fact that it's based on resources that need to be shipped all over the world means, or has meant, that we have a globalized economy that allows us to take the best from everywhere, as well as minimize our own weaknesses. Everything from labor, to coffee, to whatever you might think of. You would not be in a society, if you go to a place that is not globalized, that essentially is landlocked, that's quite far away from the uh, port that receives trade, you're not gonna find much there, whether it's in a developed country or a developing country. And if you go to a place that's landlocked like Iowa in the US and you leave the capital city, which is of course funded by a national government that is heavily dependent, that gets its resources from and it's taxes and it's debt from the trade of resources that we just talked about, you're going to see not much there. You're going to see liquor stores, laundromats, and several churches. 
And that's probably about it. Oh, shopping mall. You see shopping malls as well. So, the mistake we make when we think about globalization is the idea, first of all, that it's a superficial thing that's, that can be cut off at any point in time. And once cut off, can allow us more flexibility or higher wages. The difficulty in all of this is that once again, you don't want to live in a society where capital, which also includes debt, is in a position not to develop places that would otherwise be able to maximize human, human potential. So as I said, whether you go to a city in America or whether you go to a town in a developing country, you, unless you're tied into this globalized economy, you will not see much development there. That means you won't see a university, you won't see you know, a, an advertising agency, you won't see the kind of things that you would associate with being a successful, prosperous country. Because at the end of the day, all of these things come from the existence of a globalized market that was supposed to run on taxes and revenue, but increasingly runs on debt. And without debt, you do not have development. You have a society that looks the same as, as it did 100 years ago. Literally the same. But perhaps with a television, a small television in somebody's house, or of course now a mobile phone. Now, what I am attempting to explain is that the idea of globalization was to create a society where we would be able to get the best of all possible worlds, but of course in this, in this context, the best of all possible countries within a standardized system that promoted the sort of things that you learn about in school, law and order, rule of law, consistency, stability, and security. In 1945, you had a situation where because the United States was more comfortable creating and exporting a kind of debt-based system and a capital, capital development system that allowed a floating currency, that allowed other countries to receive loans in US dollars and then in exchange be tied into a security framework and an economic framework. In exchange for all that, was able to be on the path of that ship from LA to South Africa, to Oslo and so on. Now, once you understand that, the second thing you need to understand is that this system was never intended to run purely on debt. It was, at the same time, intended to also create a transfer of culture. The fact of the matter is, most people are inbred, whether they're on an island or not. And of course, part of that is just a lack of public transportation for most of human history. But the other part of it was the, the lack of affordability and the lack of a, a uh, linguistic skill set that applies across the world. So when we think about human beings, whether we want to admit it or not, if you live in an area that has a majority of people with blue eyes, the fact of the matter is the only way that you can have that is if you're in a very isol isolated place like Finland, a place where until recently had very little immigration, very little trade, or a place that has segregation. And so what geography wrought, human beings decided to enact on their own. And the reason for that is because blue eyes and white skin, they're all recessive. 
what you, when you go to a place that has had ample colonization, which is the extraction of resources by militarily superior powers without regard to human, human rights or a long-term vision of development, you see a multitude of colors, Africa being the primary example. And you can't even explain it because we don't even have words for these colors, in the English language especially, because it's not something that's common in the West or in Europe yet. So the idea behind globalization is not only meant what we just talked about, it has also meant a transfer of everything to make it so that we don't live in a society that runs on materialism, that it actually creates the kind of idea seeking that you would expect from a collision of great minds in the same room. We can easily see that when it comes to food. You have fusion all over the place. But for whatever reason, people have a harder time seeing it as a result of trade and immigration that results in resettlement. So what has actually happened, if you take a country like Singapore and Norway, which is quite a contrast, not just in climate, but of course with Norway having access to oil and Singapore having access not to oil, but to perhaps the most efficient port in Southeast Asia since the 1960s. You can see that both of these countries, small populations, not very attractive places to live, have managed to become perhaps two of the most successful countries in the whole world today. Based on Norway's oil, which it sold and put into a sovereign wealth fund, and Singapore's capacity to accept a Norwegian or US ship under a global security umbrella and have it continue to move forward with the necessary repairs and refueling in the most efficient way possible. So the consequence of having this globalized system is not only, not only the fact that Singapore is one of the most diverse places in the whole world, it's got about 20% of its population from somewhere else, not citizens, but workers. It's also the fact that you can see that this system, system of globalization results in revenue to a certain number of players, primarily people that have, since 1945, been involved in oil and gas and banking. And these people need places to invest. So what we've, what we've really been able to create, if you want to really sort of put it in context, is the idea that once you trade gargantuan amounts of things, you have to have a banking system and a currency and a debt market that allows you to create all sorts of other things that create, that then lead to a functioning global economy that is supposed to facilitate not just the movement of things, but of people. And that is where we failed. <sighs> The fact of the matter is, if you, nobody would really want to live in Norway, it's, you know, you know uh, unless they had a substantial sovereign wealth fund. A lot of what you hear about in terms of the equality system, it's, it's propaganda, it's marketing. You know, Norway is, it's a difficult climate, sparsely populated, you know, clearly doesn't have things like Indonesian coffee or, you know, the kind of weather and beaches that you would expect. And it's quite in the middle of nowhere. It is, of course, close to Europe, but not significantly so. Obviously, though, it's not as isolated as the United States. And so, despite all of that, or perhaps because of it, Norway has one of the most interesting citizens and immigrants in the world. Her name is Grace Bulan. She's from an African country, South Sudan. And she is now a Norwegian citizen. And she, she, of course, stands out. Because, again, if you're, for the most part, everywhere, people have been inbreeding. It's a terrible word, but I use it all the time. 
because it's true. And so to have someone like that come in changes the culture with one person being able to move from one country to the next and create this idea of possibility. And that is really what trade was supposed to mean. The idea of possibility of somebody growing up, speaking a completely different language, and then one day finding herself in a country where everything is different from the place where she was born. That is only possible in some respects if you have a society where a superpower or a dominant force is able to export its version of the rule of law backed by its military to enforce contracts globally. Now, what's happened over time is that debt, as well as the lawyers, have run amok. What started out quite well has now sort of become a victim of, victim of its own success. So within, within the US, we now have at least between one and two trillion dollars of student loans. In other words, for the chance to achieve a middle-class lifestyle, this country, one country, has managed to put its citizens or its residents in debt between one and two trillion dollars. You can only, you can imagine if this is something that's happening within the country on one issue like education, you can only imagine how much debt is in circulation worldwide. And of course, it's many, many trillions of dollars. And in fact, the United States today, though it calls itself a superpower, needs about a trillion dollars a year in order to run the country. In other words, it has a trillion dollar deficit every year. So, remember that the difference between the Soviet Union, which was the country that marched into Berlin to remove Hitler, and the difference between the United States in 1945 was that one had a floating currency that actively sought far away countries as part of its naval system in order to achieve a global banking system. And the other one focused on physical infrastructure and farming and agriculture in order to promote self-sufficiency. And today, the Soviet Union, which is now called Russia, as of 2019, last year, does not have a trillion dollar deficit. That country has a surplus or had a surplus. You can see that something has gone wrong in the system. When a country that collapsed in 1990, 1991 is now the country that does not have a massive annual deficit. But you can also see why the United States is in this position to have a deficit. Because once again, the idea is to create a global economy that allows the free movement of people and products in order to diversify everything. Genetics, food, agricultural water, resources, and so on. What has happened is because a lot of these resources are finite, what has actually happened is that the fight for these resources has resulted in geopolitical games that no longer work. Because in 1945, up until Vietnam, the United States, under, under the Marshall Plan, spent significant time, effort, and money in order to make Germany and Japan allies. It took the people that were its sworn enemies, it didn't speak the same language, and it made them, until today, and, and hopefully in the future, not only some two of the strongest countries in the whole world, but two of the best places to live. And it did so despite not having a common language, not having a common culture, and being geographically distant, which at the time 
was a significant barrier to communication and resources, resource transfers. After Vietnam, you can see that you know, the Vietnam War caused the Civil War in Cambodia next door. You can see that what's really happening after 1955, after 1960, and so on, was this idea that that might makes right and rather than create a situation where we can promote the free transfer of goods and people in order to diversify everything, you can see that people got the idea that it was perfectly fine to go into another country, extract its resources, put the politicians in a position where they would sign documents, put in their country in debt, in a foreign currency, and then not necessarily having an interest in developing that country long-term, at least not in the same way as with Germany and Japan. The consequence of that has been a moral failure. It started from Vietnam, through Iraq, and lots of other issues in between, Libya, and so on. And we tend to think of these issues and wars in isolated circumstances, but they're not. All of them come from a moral failure post-Vietnam, where despite invading Iraq twice, um, the country that was a former ally of the US, no one believes that Iraq today, or Baghdad or otherwise, will be like Japan or Germany in the next 25 or 30 years. It's hopefully that it will be the case, but very few people believe that. But there's no reason why that shouldn't be the goal, except that we have too much debt. When you have so much debt, suddenly your economy is no longer running on this mutually beneficial global system. It's gasping for air. And as a result of gasping for air, it's put itself in a position where it can no longer be the moral leader of the whole world, which affects its ability to be the economic leader of the whole world as well. So, what we, when we talk about decoupling, when we talk about deglobalization, what we're really talking about is a moral failure of the U.S. that started in Vietnam and that continued through Iraq that has now affected its ability to be an economic superpower worldwide. And along the way, even the banking system is under pressure for a, multitude, for a multitude of reasons, one of which is simply the fact that banking has always been the act of digital security. You're transferring money worldwide. That has to be a secure process. That involves the situation where the banks are really technology companies in disguise. So on top of that, you have this idea where if you don't have a country that has a clear moral position, that country will have a harder time exporting its rule of law. It will have a harder time exporting its culture. And if you look at the countries that are now most closely allied with the US, South Korea, uh, Israel, Taiwan, and so on, those countries are for the most part lacking in at least as of today, in the kind of things that you would expect to create a culture, an independent culture. And if you look at something like K-pop, Korean pop, which is apparently wildly popular, even the dance moves are copied from the United States, and even those dance moves are copied from Michael Jackson. If you look at Taiwan, which is allegedly within the U.S. ambit in order to promote democracy. It really is in a very strategic location because it's next to the South China Sea, which is a, an area that is crucially vital for trade all over the world, especially with respect to Chinese oil and gas. So suddenly you have these countries that are being developed but not in a way that maximizes development in terms of human potential. It's not 
the same as, say, Norway, where they can take someone like Grace Spiegelin. It's not quite the same thing in Taiwan or in South Korea. And, th and that ultimately is what society is missing out on. One of the reasons that I do these things in the middle of the night is because I spent a lifetime trying to figure out why things are the way they are. Because it's quite clear that they don't have to be in this particular way. They don't have to have light bulbs on that are connected to a, are connected to a system that burns coal or gas or LNG. It just so happens that's a system that we've come up with and no energy source is cost free because the other problem with this globalized system is that at some point we're in a position where we have vast environmental consequences worldwide. Singapore, as one of the examples, uh, regularly has pollution alerts because of Indonesia's volcanoes. But it's probably not just the volcanoes, it's obviously also the fact that, Singapore, that Indonesia primarily uses coal for energy. And so within this globalized system that was supposed to have the rule of law in a way that made everyone's lives better, you can see that there are limits. And in the year 2020, when we talk about decoupling, when we talk about deglobalization, we're trying to understand the scope of those limits. But what has really happened here and the reason that things have gone awry in the field of politics is because not only, not only do people lack vision, but they've forgotten what globalization was supposed to be about. And this whole idea, this whole meandering half an hour has been the idea that globalization was supposed to maximize human potential so that a little girl in South Sudan, who may not have been in the most secure of circumstances, could one day wake up in a secure, safe place, get an education, and create a life that was that's meaningful. And in the process of doing so, create a bridge between different cultures as well as different continents that would then make it easier to transfer not just products and metals, but understanding. And you can only do that if you invest in things like, you know, translations. Um, if you have a society where somebody grows up with two languages and is, and is then able to translate the great works of literature into a format that is understandable. And if you've ever tried to read a foreign book, you, you know right off the bat that the ability to translate a book is almost impossible to do well unless you grow up with two languages and in the culture. And so when we talk about human knowledge and adding to human knowledge, what we're talking about is this idea that all knowledge is incremental. That when you study a poem as simple as My Love Is Like a Red, Red Rose in high school, it may not be a very good poem, but in order, in order to get to a Shakespearean sonnet, in order to get to a poem that's truly incredible, you need to be exposed to as many different forms of knowledge as you possibly can so that one day you wake up and without even knowing it, you've incrementally and slowly but consistently gained all this knowledge that allows you to have an, under an, an understanding of the world in which you live. And the only way to do that is if we don't live in a society where a superpower that, is, that has moral failings and has had moral failings for 60 years is exporting its legal and cultural systems in such a way that wipes out the other countries, the satellite countries' culture, or that makes, it, that makes them mere copies of its own, simply to trade goods worldwide. So the United States today has a choice. It can try to create a world in which it is a moral leader, in which case it would have to do a significant U-turn. And the question is whether it can even do so, given its problems here at home, not just in debt, but in terms of corruption. But the other question is, if it's not going to be the United States, 
if we're going to come into this process of deglobalization, who is it going to be? Who is going to lead that way in a way that makes sense? And who is going to have the ability to risk financial investment under a system that it hasn't made on its own, under a, under a system that has been imposed on it and the rest of the world since 1945 that may no longer make sense? Because once again, the only way these investments make sense, the only way that these satellite countries become carbon copies culturally of a dominant homing base is if there's a system of trust and capital that's deployed worldwide that allows these satellite countries to be, to have a, not just an economic stake, but a security stake in the home base that becomes the foundation for everything else. And so you have a situation where Taiwan ends up making semiconductors for a significant portion of the world. Vietnam ends up making shoes for Nike. Indonesia makes, ends up making clothing for Nike. And all these, country, all these companies in the U.S. that are massively successful, in many cases, do not manufacture anything in the U.S., partly because of this idea that we're going to create a world standard that, is, that rises everyone's Stand, raises everyone's standard of living. And to do that, you actually have to make sacrifices as a, as a country because you have to give up those jobs within the country in order to have friends outside of the country. So you don't end up manufacturing shoes in the U.S. You give those jobs to another country, which can then move up the value supply, value chain, but in a way that promotes the naval and sea-based trade network and the rule of law that was dictated to the whole world in 1945, that only the United States sought to promote while the other superpower sought a different direction in order to avoid debt. So when we look at this system, if you have a system of, of increasing unemployment, a system where within that home base, within that home base you no longer have a population that is convinced that it's going to give up all those jobs to, to foreign countries in order to gain friendship and to maintain the standard the standardization of rule of law that benefits the home base if you're going to have that situation where people don't have that idea that their lives are getting better then you're going to have, a, have to have a lot of propaganda, a lot of marketing to make them feel that way and that's going to involve bending the truth. That is what's happened here in the U.S. And people are probably quite sick of it. And then because they're sick of it, they're willing to do anything to get out, to get out from under this fog of propaganda, fog of propaganda. And if it's not going to be the case that we accept this paradigm, this economic paradigm that allows us to trade jobs or lower employment for global friendship, that promotes cultural understanding as well as a banking system and the laws within those banking systems dictated and created by the country with the most secure banking system, namely the U.S. today. If we're not going to have that, what is going to be the alternative route, the, the other paradigm? And that is what we're trying to figure out today, which is why it feels so unstable in so many ways, but all of that once again goes back to the fact that we haven't figured out how to actually trade in a way that promotes a long-term relationship, not just of goods, but of a sustainable debt structure for everyone at home and abroad. Because it's just too damn easy when you have the world's best banking system to create a paradigm where you continue to borrow and as long as you're borrowing, you let your friends borrow as well. And you can see how this is unsustainable in, in the long term, because obviously you have unequal inflation, which, is, which then leads to unequal asset values, which then leads to a lot unequal inequality within the country, 
from sector to sector, from province to province, from state to state, from city to city, based on connections to the federal government or to venture capitalists or to the banking system. You can see how the country does feel as if it's being torn apart because it, it, actually, it actually is. Because all these systems that were supposed to promote a singular moral rule of law have failed. And all these satellite countries are no longer in a position where they can enjoy the largesse of a rising standard of living without the debt that follows it. And that is presum presumably not a, not a kind of lifestyle that people want to live. They don't want to live in a society where debt controls their future. But here we are. And the problem with a society where debt and an economy where debt controls the future is that you end up in a position where stability becomes more important than creativity. Why? Because in order to pay off the debt, you have to have stability in order to attract investment. You have to have a society that's willing to cover up its flaws in order to attract investment against the competitor that is trying to lure those same dollars into its country, into its ambit, in order to export its preferred rule of law and its culture. And this becomes vastly more difficult the more countries you have under this ambit, under, under this security umbrella, because there are only so many jobs you can export all over the world in order to create a mutually beneficial transactional paradigm based on a sea-based trade, especially with finite resources. And so when you have a society that's dictated by debt, you have a society that prizes stability over all things. And this has happened right here in San Jose where once upon a time, the newspaper used to publish about 10, 15 years ago, uh, critiques of the local police department. And suddenly it stopped. And when you look back on it, no one's reported on this, but when you look, when, when you look back on it, which, what really happened was all these pension funds, uh, which of course are billions of dollars in value at this point, probably bought up the newspapers and then dictated to them what they could publish. And over time, promoted stability over critique and criticism that, were, were, that were, might have otherwise led to growth. And so here we are, 15, 10 years later, and now we have the same problems. We have a movement that is dedicated to reforming police departments that is now going to be exquisitely difficult because the corruption is not only financial, it's seeped into every aspect of the legal system, lawyers, judges, everyone, in a way that, once again, is based on massive debt rather than efficiency and the criticism, the public criticism that journalism used to inspire in order to make a society better and more just and to have that rule of law based on a foundation of morality. So here we are. And hopefully things make more sense now. If you have a society that has a, that assumes that their pension fund that's worth billions of dollars uh, on the local level and then on the state level, half a trillion dollars, they have to earn seven to eight percent a year as the assumption. You can see how that kind of a paradigm that's politically motivated is going to result in stability, which then manifests itself in a one-party state, which is what California is right now. Every, every office is controlled by either a single party or a majority of that same party. This all makes sense. And it's actually, there's now actual overlap with a religion within the state, making the accusation that, you know, that making it a viable accusation to say that it's not really a religion anymore, it's more of a political movement because of the overlap suddenly you have a system that sorts, that tries to co-opt everything, whether through a buyout or some other fashion, in order to, in order to promote continue, continued investment, continued banking influence, but without the necessary criticism and growth that we just talked about that was a vital component, that was the point of having diversification economically 
genetically and cultural, culturally. Because there's no one today that thinks it's going to be as easy for a child that's born in a developing country to make her way or his way to a big city like Oslo. Primarily because in order to maintain this one party system, this stable system, for one thing, <laughs> it's too expensive, which is what we just talked about. The houses here are $1 million. There's no way that a refugee could afford to live here, that her parents could afford to live here in a stable way. So you now have the outgrowth of religious organizations and nonprofits that are an arm of the government of that same one party structure, which then promotes once again, a barrier to creativity and diversification. And it just keeps happening over and over again because it compounds itself. Success begets success and corruption begets corruption. And when we look at the United States today, it's clear what has to be done, but it's also clear that we're going to, it's going to have to cooperate or at least create a new paradigm in order to be a shining city on a hill that a little girl born in a different place could one day see herself living in as opposed to an expensive place that very few people can afford to live in because of the way that it's been structured and of the way that it's snuffed out criticism. So where do we go from here? It's anyone's guess, but it seems to me that we've talked about a before a multipolar world, but we haven't yet gotten there. We're on the way to getting there. And the sooner we get to it, the better. And the question is, how do we get there in a way that avoids war? And we just talked about one of those ways, which is diversification economically. In order to prevent a situation where you go to war in order to get a resource that you need because you've, you've created a society that's based on an economy that needs that finite resource in order to function, not, not to thrive, but to function. And if people think that switching from oil to gas to LNG and eventually to a lithium-based system is going to be any better, I got news for you. Lithium is also toxic. It also requires mining. A batteries require electricity. And renewables are, are not capable of creating the kind of consistent energy that we need in order to maintain a large interconnected grid of power. Which then takes us back to the idea that globalization, which was supposed to smooth out these issues, is today more necessary than ever, but somehow lacks the political will to get to where it needs to be which all goes back to the fact that it's almost impossible today to imagine a little girl named Grace Bulin, born in a different place, imagining herself here in this city of million dollar homes.